Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said to the crowd, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So, please be seated. If any of you um, have ever flipped through YouTube, you might have seen the channel, St. Effie and Friends, wherein this will shortly appear. But if you look at it, you'll find that YouTube will suggest to you videos you might like to see, based on what you've been watching. And uh, it's kind of the thing they do. And one of the little suggestions from YouTube to me was this interview with a man from the Hadza people in Tanzania. And the Hadza had recently been attracting a little bit of attention in the media and the press and scholarship and so on, because they're still hunter-gatherers. That is, they live not by farming or by herding animals, but by hunting wild animals and by gathering wild food. In that respect, they're a bit like many of the peoples in um, Papua New Guinea, and like the Bushmen of the Kalahari in Southern Africa and Namibia. But the Hadza, for some reason, have attracted a lot of attention recently. And there's been a lot of speculation about their lifestyle, about the fact that they eat a bit of meat, they're constantly nibbling on vegetables, and how this is good for people, because they're always moving, this kind of thing. And it's, it's thought to be healthy, but this is what we're adapted for. Our bodies are designed for that kind of lifestyle. And so, there's also a kind of undercurrent that somehow people living this kind of lifestyle must have some kind of wisdom. It's not that prominent, but there's this idea that kind of reappears periodically that somehow people living alternative lifestyles around the world have, have a kind of wisdom that somehow we're lacking in the West. And so this wisdom seeker from the West went to meet one of these Hadza hunters and asked him, what's the most important thing in life? And he's obviously hoping for some deep spiritual insight or some profound advice or proverb or something. And the man thought for a minute and he said, the most important thing in life, meat, he said. <laughs> and the bloke said, what? He said, meat. Without meat, we cannot be happy. We need meat. And the man said, really? Oh, yes, he said, we need meat. Look, there's baboons on that cliff there that sleep in there. Tonight I'm going to go and kill them and then we're going to eat them. And the man went, oh. <laughs> And then the hunter sort of thought, ah, and honey. He said, honey's great, I love honey. <laughs> and then there's this kid with him. And the kid said, ah, but we need water. Because if we don't drink water, we will die. And I said, yes, you're right. If we don't drink water, we will die. The most important things in life, he said, meat, honey, water. And so on Friday, we had a barbecue. <laughs> we had meat. We had some water, and we didn't have any honey, so we're obviously lacking a little bit. But, well, there we are. <laughs> and it kind of resonated, partly with this thing from Jesus, where he says we're going to eat his flesh, which is kind of a grotesque thought, but also the kind of folly of looking around for wisdom. You might remember in the 60s and 70s, and to a certain extent in the 80s, there was this great idea that wisdom came from the East. And people went off to the East looking for wisdom. You know, the hippie trail was people looking for wisdom. They'd drift off. They'd, I mean, you couldn't do it now, could you? And the hippie trail now would be simply impossible because they'd drift off, they'd hitchhike their way 
through Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Afghanistan, <laughs> would you believe it? Um, they go through Iran and then into India. And usually they kind of grind to a halt somewhere in India. And there are still people living there that followed the hippie trail and never left, looking for wisdom. But if there's such wisdom in India, is wisdom a model of good governance, of happiness, of prosperity, and peace, and tranquility, and all the other things you want to live in? Well, no, not really, frankly. So, I think wisdom is found somewhere else. And the wisdom that we have, that we have inherited, if you like, which for some reason our contemporaries and some of our predecessors have kind of scorned, is this wisdom that was described in our readings. In the first one it talked from Proverbs, Wisdom has built her house, hewn out her pillars, slaughtered her animals, those echoes of the hands are there, she's mixed her wine, set her table, sent out her servant girls and called, You that are simple, come in. To those without sense, come, eat and drink what I've mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live. Walk in the way of insight. And this idea of wisdom, in Hebrew, hokma, and we've got two little girls here called Sophia, <laughs> which is the Greek word for wisdom. But this idea of wisdom is a, quite an important theme in Scripture, really throughout the whole Bible. You might say that the Scripture has two main themes running through the whole thing, from beginning to end. And these themes kind of intertwine and run, run alongside each other. One of them is the theme of wisdom, of understanding, of knowledge. And the other one is the theme of what you might call covenant. How God makes agreements and promises and keeps them and fulfills them. And how through those he saves people and he'll make all things new. And these things are closely intertwined. If you read the first um, three chapters of Genesis, you might note that Genesis chapter 1, as is well known, describes the creation story. And the name of God in that creation story is Elohim. And you might read it just as God, with a capital G in English. And that is typical of wisdom literature. It's not describing a relationship between any two people as such. It's simply saying, this is how things are. This is what the world is like. If you want to know what the universe is like, this is what it's like. And it makes very important, fundamental assertions about the universe in that first chapter. It says it's good, God made it, and it is made. And if that sounds a bit circular, you think about it, because many people over history have thought that somehow parts of the universe were somehow either made themselves or are somehow gods in themselves. And this first chapter of Genesis simply contradicts that completely, flatly. It says the stars in the sky make more than lights in the sky. They're not deities, they're not people, they're not entities, they're simply lights. That's all they are. And it also says they are good. They are very good. And it describes us, that we are made in the image of God. And that we have power in the world. And that's absolutely true. And if you want a basis for all our ethics, a solid basis for how to work out what is right and wrong and dealing with people at any scale, to my mind, the most solid basis of that is that Genesis 1, it says, and he made man in his image. Male and female, he made them. In his image, he made them. We are made in the image of God. And everyone bears the image of God. No matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter where they're from, it is there. And that should govern all our relationships, fundamentally. With evildoers, with prisoners, with foreigners, with weirdos, with people we can't stand, and with people we love. They're all made in the image of God. And that is wisdom, to understand that, to know that. Then the second third chapters of Genesis describe the fall. They talk about Adam and Eve, and they describe God speaking with them and dealing with them. But the name of God changes. He's called the Lord God. Lord often spelled with capital letters. 
And that signifies the beginning of the promise of the covenant that God will save us. Because at the end of the Genesis 3, he describes the first time how God will turn around the evil of the fall. The seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. The first time God promises he will save us. And so these two threads run beside each other all the way through the Bible. Wisdom and covenant. And this, these readings today kind of gather these two themes together. Because it's often said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the psalm emphasises that. Fear the Lord, you that are his saints. For those who fear him lack nothing. Come children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Which elsewhere is described as the beginning of wisdom. To be afraid of the Lord, to fear the Lord, is to be afraid to do wrong. It is to re reverence God. And that is wise. That is wisdom. To despise the Lord is folly. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. It fundamentally dislocates all that we know about the universe if we say there is no God. Everything shakes free and starts to drift. And the further you go down that road, the less certain anything seems. And I think we're seeing the outworking of that now in our culture, where people commonly now do not fear the Lord, do not regard, do not believe that the God made the heavens and the earth. And all our roots of our morals, our ethics, our assumptions, our understanding of the universe, they're all coming loose. They're all drifting away and falling apart. And that's because we have despised the wisdom that we inherited from our forebears. Because this is wisdom. This is truth. This is life, as the scripture says. This is not just the way the world is, it's also how we are and how we live if we want to be blessed, if we want to be happy, if we want good things to happen. And Paul says in this reading from Ephesians, brothers and sisters, be careful how you live, not as unwise people. The first part of this chapter, he goes into all the things that are unwise, which for your edification I'll briefly highlight. Sexual immorality, impurity, greed, obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, and idolatry. Because he says greed, covetousness, is a form of idolatry. Notice how greed, envy, covetousness, is put alongside sexual immorality. Now, sexual immorality now is almost a human right. But often people have understood how it could be kind of not quite on. But greed, from God's point of view, is just as evil, just as destructive. I've recently heard in the news how this guy from Plymouth, who recently shot some people, was what they call an incel now. Involuntary celibate. Have any of you heard that term before? No? Anyone? I've only heard about it recently as well, I had to look it up. But one of the things common to what they, they call these incels is a sense of resentment. That these men feel somehow humiliated and marginalised or hard done by because, for one level, they're just not getting laid. But then they feel somehow alienated from society. They somehow feel like failures and they feel humiliated. But they feel resentment. They're greedy. They want something they haven't got. And out of this rather poisonous mixture of greed and resentment and desire and envy comes all kinds of evil. But you can see that working out in all kinds of other ways. People that want money. They become resentful or greedy or avaricious because they just want money and they're angry with people that have money that they don't have or they're angry that they don't have more money or they want more and they just do anything to get it. And it's poisonous, it's horrible, it's death. But any kind of greed or graspingness or envy or covetousness has the same effect on our souls. It's the tenth commandment, isn't it? You shall not covet. And it goes through this list about donkeys and asses and all this kind of stuff, which we don't really covet very much nowadays. But the basic principle is don't covet anything. If you haven't got it, and you want it, watch out. 
because it can become death to your soul. It can kill you from inside. My father-in-law Morris used to say, oh, watch out for him, he says, it's a killer. It turns relationships sour, it poisons friendships, it sets people up for criminal activity, for backbiting and for backstabbing and everything. I recently spoke to someone who does um, work for the Department of Work and Pensions. There's a friend of mine who, who lives on benefits. He's paranoid about losing his benefits because he's disabled. And he's convinced that they're watching him to, find, to spot, catch him out. So he'll they say, ah, you're not entitled to them, we're going to take them away. He's terrified of it. And my friend said, no, they're rubbish. He said, no, I was watching anyone. I said, why? He said, we can't. There's just too many people. The only time anyone's ever investigated is when they're snitched upon. Is when someone tells on them. And as often as, often as not, it's due to greed and resentment and backbiting. It's a horrible thing. And I suppose I'm being a bit emphatic because it's so secretive. It kind of worms its way into your heart. But this is folly. This is not wisdom. Wisdom is just saying, I haven't got it, oh, never mind, whatever. That's wisdom. Wisdom is saying, gosh, that's lovely, I love it, wow, awesome, I'd love to have it, but I can't, so happy days for those who have got it. How wonderful for them that they can rejoice in this wonderful, blessed, beautiful thing, which I don't have, but other people have. We can rejoice with them and think, yes, they've got it, how wonderful. Because Jesus actually says, rejoice with those who rejoice, and mourn with those who mourn. Now, I'm not sure if this is the right time, but poor Jo has just lost her husband. And so we can be compassionate, we can grieve with her. Because even if we didn't know her, we know what it's like to lose something. And Lord bless Jo and her family as they come to terms with this. But this is wisdom. Compassion is wisdom. Moder moderation is wisdom. But more important than any of these things, this is wisdom that Jesus speaks. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. That is wisdom. That is the heavenly wisdom. That is how we live, truly. Because surely we want to live. Surely we don't want to die. We don't want to live miserably and just wait for the death and then go to hell. Surely we want to live. We want to have a bit of hope and joy in this world. We want to know eternity of, of pleasure, <laughs> of happiness, of blessedness afterwards. And that's wisdom. And this is how we get it. We eat and drink. And that's why Jesus is so emphatic, the eating and the drinking. And I think that's why we always, in the Anglican Church, have always had communion in both kinds. Unlike some churches where they only give it in one kind. Because it's just not right, because Jesus was emphatic. Eat and drink. And it doesn't really matter what we eat and drink in a way for communion, because the, it's the eating and the drinking we remember. He said, my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. How do we do that? And what sense does that make? But blood is taken up with life. You know, in the scripture, blood is always symbolic of life. You shall not eat meat with the blood in it, it says, because the life is in the blood. When Cain killed his brother, God said, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Jesus spilt his blood, his life, that we might live. And as we drink, whatever it is we're actually drinking, we remember life from Christ, that somehow we buy into his death we own his death so that we will live. Because he gave it freely that we would live. Life from his death. And this is heavenly wisdom. This is the wisdom from God. This is the way to life. This is the fear of the Lord. This is everything we need to know. And here it is, just written out for us. We don't need to go to India, to the mountains of Nepal and find some bloke in a cave. We don't need to go to the deserts of the Kalahari to ask Bushmen. Because here it is. This is wisdom. This is what we need to know. Whoever eats of me will live because of me. 
This is the bread that came down from heaven, not that which your ancestors ate when they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. 